This is the Golan Heights, 10 kilometers to the south, 60 kilometers to the north, watching Israel, its water resources, mountains, and settlements down there. If we did not fight for the Golan Heights, ISIS would be sitting here. Rabbi Yuval Sherla was a teacher at the Golan Heights Yeshiva during the 90s, when Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin, his childhood hero, the architect of the Six Days War, was willing to give away these strategic mountains in the future agreements with Syria. It seemed to be a policy of madness. It was just crazy, leaving the Golan Heights with all its meanings. The meaning for the greater Israel, through risking losing water resources, endangering the state of Israel. It just sounded completely mad. They were going to uproot us. That was something incomprehensible. I mainly remember going to a demonstration by Yitzhak Rabin's home in Ramad Aviv. There was a very passionate rally there, an enthusiastic protest. It felt legitimate standing up in front of his own home, demonstrating in full force. It was a very strong and loud demonstration. There was lots of shouting, but the protest was all within the limits of the law. We protested within the limits of the law, but no, it was not a calm demonstration. What did you yell? I do not really remember, but I think shouting ranged from we will not leave the Golan, not moving from the Golan, to what price will we pay for leaving. And maybe there were some personal threats to himself. I really don't remember. But history remembers. In 1993, Rabin changed the course of history. For the first time, an Israeli leader negotiated directly with a PLO leader. <laughs> Following the Oslo Accord, Rabin was awarded by the prestigious Nobel Peace Prize along with his partners in the process, Shimon Peres and the Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. By the end of 94, Israel achieved an agreement with Jordan. Progress with Palestinians and Syrian peace talks appeared to be on the way. The dream of a new Middle East seemed closer than ever. The utopia clashed against violent activism. Extremist Jews and Palestinians carried out acts of terror on both sides as negotiations progressed. Rabin's opposition was determined. The idea of giving up parts of the Holy Land was unconceivable to many and threatened to tear apart Israeli society. I was a French man living partly in Israel and was actively engaged in helping Israelis achieving peace. I know precisely at what moment I took on the responsibility to try and organize this rally. I've seen on TV a very shocking demonstration. I think it was at Zion Square in Jerusalem. Netanyahu, he gave a speech and besides him, there was a big sign of Rabin in SS uniform. The idea that the Prime Minister could be represented as an SS made me furious. Then I decided we had to do something to show that the people supported Rabin and supported peace. That Saturday started with a tense anticipation for the rally. The streets were abandoned to the opposition for many months. And suddenly the camp of light came together. And I remember Rabin standing on the stage. When he came up to speak, he looked at the crowd, seeing 150,000 people filling up the square and the surrounding streets. 
You could see that he was amazed. And he raised his arms and sighed. There, it was the first time he understood how many people loved him and supported him. We were standing in the audience, right in the middle, where it was so crowded that you couldn't see. Jonathan even picked me up on his shoulders because I couldn't see. There was an agreement between us. During the rally, he will agree to anything we ask him. I pulled up a paper. It was lyrics. I prepared and I said, listen, go back on stage and sing with everyone. He answered, sing? I don't know how to sing. He mumbled the lyrics into the microphone. That was just amazing. It is very rare that he opened his mouth to sing. He was so off-key. He sang, and Minister Shimon Peres sang, and all the people standing on stage sang a song for peace. When it was over, he came and shook hands with our cameraman and everyone on stage. Then he went down the stairs, and I went back home. I returned home and was about to unlock the door when it opened from inside. Saturday evening, I'm with a group of 30 students and my young son. I guess he was eight years old, suddenly came running. And Jonathan stood there, and it wasn't as if we had just parted a moment ago. His face was a gray. He made a gesture with his hand to silence me. What happened? They shot Rabin. They shot Rabin. Hello, from Talad Studios in Jerusalem. We have an announcement. About half an hour ago, at the end of a support rally at Tel Aviv Main Square, there was an attempt to assassinate Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. The man who shot Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin is Igal Amir from Hertelia, single, 26 years old. The information we have says that he was close to the extreme right group called Eyal. I remember everything. I said to the anchor, I said, uh, the anchorman in, in the studio in Jerusalem was Yaakov Elon. I said, Yaakov, I've been working for many years as a journalist. Yaakov, it never occurred to me that I will be the one to announce what we just announced here. And the commotion behind me is really secondary. It's really secondary. Shimon Sheves came out, grabbed me, and whispered in my ear, It's over. He is gone. Then began some kind of farewell saga or ceremony. It was strange because it kind of ran itself. As the moments passed, it looked like hours, but it was minutes. In nuance, life changed. Like the moment where everybody took out their cigarettes and kids smoked next to their parents. It's little things, but for me, that was the night our childhood ended. It's a rare moment when your personal and your life as a citizen of this country came together. Feeling that the responsible adult was lost forever. 
and ask of you to rest in peace and to think about us and miss us. Because we here, down below, love you so very much. My grandma asked to see him, and it was clear that we were all getting in. We entered. I remember I gave him a kiss. And I remember my grandfather looked asleep and relieved. He had a calm face. He didn't feel pain. It didn't hurt him. That was a consolation that night, the feeling that he left us calm. But the big insult of being shot in the back, the back of a leader that always faced life head on, so the feeling that he didn't know that's how he died, that's at least what I hoped. It gave me strength for the first few days and years. What changed in me? I think I'm not the same man I was before the murder. I'm a sadder man. After that, I was a lot less optimistic about the human race. I felt shame, deeply ashamed of belonging to a people where a prime minister is murdered. After this, you can't sit still anymore and be quiet. You can't live aside anymore. Shortly after Robin's assassination, Sherlo left the Golan Heights and established Sohar, an organization serving as a bridge between religious and secular Jewish Israelis. He became a central figure in Israeli religious Zionist community. Sherlo and his students celebrate Sukkot, a Jewish holiday. Those youngsters are a part of a new generation, a generation who did not know Robin. This year, Israel marks the 19th anniversary of the assassination. Peace with Syria is a distant dream. And just recently, another round of fire with the Palestinians ended with much blood. Public atmosphere, however, remained similar. Perhaps even more extreme with this new generation using social medias as an amplifier. We didn't learn the lesson. The incitement continues. And to this day, I think Rabin's assassination only lowered the barrier. The next political assassination is only a matter of time. I personally have no doubt. No one else took public responsibility. No one stood with a flag demanding accountability. Not a personal one that will reappear that real damage Israeli democracy suffered, the injustice. That murder changed Israeli politics forever, because six months later, that same public atmosphere was translated to electoral votes to real change. In that sense, the murderer won. Of course I am angry. How can you not be? How can you not be? Jews are way more intelligent than to simply follow this path that leads to nowhere. I trust the sense of life that the Jewish people have. I continue to sing this song, but usually at memorial rallies, memorials for him, perhaps even in memory of peace. Thank you.